Hey there, and welcome back to RimWorlds. Boy, does it feel good to finally say that again. Yes, we're back, the adventure continues, and this time we have the Biotech DLC to explore too. Now, last time we left off was a few months ago in the Cold Bog with these lovely fellows, the Cult of Jinx. If you have not watched that series yet, I recommend you do, as this one directly builds upon the events that took place during those first 36 episodes. In the grand finale of our Cult of Jinx series, we then selected five pawns to leave the small swamp village of Liviana. In exchange, they received the first part of a map to the mysterious Arconexus. That is what we are ultimately trying to reach, but for now our five pawns are starting fresh on a new map tile with its very own much more pressing challenges waiting for them. And just to get you reacquainted, those five pawns are Wyatt, the ugly tough brawler who's also a skilled craftsman, Light, the psychically hypersensitive psychopath, completely blind but potentially the most powerful psychast at this side of the swamp, Took, the sanguine master cook and combat specialist, his lover Squeaks, industrious undergrounder with a knack for animals, preferably bears, and finally Kevin, the misogynist medical specialist with an aptitude for social and intellectual work. And just as a side note, all of these characters are named after Patreon supporters, and all of the characters added in this series will be too, so if you want to get your name into the series, or just want to support what I'm doing, feel free to head over to the Patreon and consider a small pledge, you can find links on screen and down below. Now to wrap up our previous series, we were tasked with selecting a few items and animals that these five pawns can bring along to found their new colony, and we took a few bears for Squicks to handle, the powerful Red Hawk Plasma Sword for Wyatt, some medicine, a few doomsdays, a sniper rifle and some starting funds. And this is where we pick things back up today, let's see exactly where our new colony will be founded. Of course, I've put some thought into this, and as you know, I like a good challenge. Unfortunately, we have experienced the most challenging biomes already, Ice Sheet, Extreme Desert and Cold Bog, but there is one that, while perhaps not on the level of the aforementioned, I would still consider pretty challenging, the tropics. Specifically the tropical rainforest, because no, I have no desire to play another series in the swamp. This tile right here meanwhile offers year-round growing temperatures, lush vegetation, a river, some caves and mountains to explore and sturdy granite and beautiful marble, but also a plethora of wild predators, rampant diseases and choking overgrowth that makes it difficult to find building space. So I think we are once again in for a good challenge here, but before we can touch ground we need to pick our ideology. And while we could simply continue as the Cult of Jinx with all the memes and precepts you can see here, I don't think we want to do that. Instead, I think it's time to go with something brand new, and let me paint you a little picture of how I came up with this. During their journey halfway across the globe, which I imagine took a while, our five pawns most likely had some time to reflect. They may not have left the Cult of Jinx on bad terms, but they certainly all had and still have their very own views on its beliefs and principles. Most of them they probably even agree with, Squeaks was a large part of the Rancher meme for example, while Light pretty much embodies the ultimate form of blindside, Wyatt and Kevin both shared connections with their Garrandon trees and the dryads they spawned, and they all carry their scars from the Penis Virtue meme. On the other hand, by the end Wyatt was actually the most disliked person in the Cult of Jinx, Misogynist Kevin likely never really felt at home in a place ruled mostly by women, took in squicks, might plan to have children together, and could feel that the village is not the right home to raise them, and let's be honest, Light was never really more than just a psychically gifted tool to be used. Add to that the face masks, the routine capture and execution of prisoners, the brutal killing of hundreds of tribals, Redini's fanatical desire to convert everyone and everything to the Cult of Jinx, I think there are enough reasons here for these five to want a fresh start. Now at the moment they are still a bit confused and perhaps overwhelmed with agreeing on a complex new belief system, to be fair they are probably not sure what to believe, but there is one thing they do know, some of the stuff the Cult of Jinx did was really messed up. And because of that I think it's time for a change in direction. Perhaps unexpected, perhaps unusual, but I think it fits the story of a band of voluntary outcasts, we are going with the guilty meme to start. This means that our pawns want to actually do some good, they want to help people, maybe as a way to repent for their sins of the past. Now whether or not they will succeed or just succumb to their old ways, that is very much up in the air at this point, but I think it's a fresh direction, not to mention that it also offers a few interesting new gameplay mechanics and even keeps some of the ideas of the pain is virtue meme, as you can see by the idealized pain precept down here. And this is also why I think there is a good chance of this becoming more than just a goody-two-shoes ideology, which would indeed be a stark difference to the Cult of Jinx, 
Perhaps our pawns believe that redemption through self-sacrifice applies not only to them and might just occasionally be forced upon others as well. Now, what we haven't talked about yet is the ideology's name, the Believers of Boyo. Boyo, a name chosen from the list of patrons in the naming rights tier, and the ideology's core figure, and prominently featured in its description. During their exodus, a new generation came to understand the faults of their old ways through the teachings of the martyr Boyo, who willingly endured pain and suffering to aid others. Inspired by his compassion and self-sacrifice, they now strive to emulate his benevolence in their own lives. Followers are encouraged to be charitable not only with their resources, but also with their own comfort, health and well-being, viewing pain as a means to understand and ease the suffering of those in need. So, pain and charity are the core virtues of this ideology, and we'll see what else will be added in the near future, as we are once again keeping this a fluid ideology. Apart from those two core precepts, however, no other rules and beliefs are really worth mentioning in too much detail. Most of it here is pretty standard stuff. Executions and slavery are a bit more frowned upon than they were in the Cult of Jinx. Our pawns are still mildly bigoted, but that's about it. Rules and rituals are nothing unusual either. We have no specialist rules just yet, and we're using the symbol burning and social festival this time around. And the rest is mostly cosmetics, so no need to go over all of it. Don't worry though, we will hopefully be able to very quickly accumulate ideology development points through our acts of charity, so we will be adding new stuff soon I think. The first relic we are after is an LTEC staff by the way, although I am not sure how much of a role I want relics to play in this series. In the last one, hunting them down often felt more tedious than adventurous, and I think we have now experienced all the different quest types associated with them anyway. So then, let's get going. There are a few minor organizational matters too that I would like to mention, but we'll talk about those at the end of the video or in fitting moments during the gameplay, so that we can now finally jump right into the action and take a closer look at the map that we have chosen. As our five colonists land, we get a quick introduction which tells us that the other two parts of the Arconexus map are in the hands of two factions that are very much hostile to us, so this could get interesting although we are still quite some time away from actually having enough wealth to trade for it. So instead of the Arconexus map, let's worry about the actual map we are playing on, and what a map it is, one of the more unique ones I've had the pleasure of playing on over the years. On the left here we have a river going directly through the mountain, there is also a lot of mountain overall, the map looks very funnelable to me, if you know what I mean, lots of natural corridors and blockades, that could be useful. Of note then, of course, the location of the anima tree, and this time around also of the steam geysers, of which there are not too many, but one or two in what could be convenient locations. Of particular importance is also this thing right here, the major architect structure. As you can see, we need to investigate this with someone skilled in research. A grand total of 2100 points of study need to be completed, and until then, the structure will emit a not so pleasant psychic pulse that lowers the mood of anyone standing too close. So, this could be a small challenge here early on, and next to that, our first priorities should of course be food and shelter. For the first time, we are not starting with nothing, so weapons and clothing are already taken care of. And food follows shortly after, as Took quickly begins to decimate the local alpaca population, while Kevin sets out to study the major architect structure. Now, you definitely do not need to do this right away, as you can see it also comes with a hefty minus 10 mood penalty, but it just seems to me like someone as intellectually gifted as Kevin would be curious, and at the moment Kevin's mood is pretty high, as it is for the rest of our colonists, so he can take the minus 10 hit without it affecting him too much. As you can see, for our first base then, we have located some nearby caves. This will of course not be our permanent place of residence, but it is close by to the architect structure and very easily closed off, so it strikes me as the best place to settle down to get us started here. For the first time then, we are also chopping some wood, and just as we do, we are informed of a nearby hunting worksite, this one inhabited by five people and promising moderate amounts of light leather and pemmican. However, traveling through the jungle, it would still take us about one day to get there, so I don't think we're going to do that this episode. But if you would like to see our colonists make the journey, then let me know in the comments down below. In the meantime, we can see Wyatt with a plant skill of 3 and Light with a plant skill of 4 working on some very sturdy teak trees. I think wood will once again be the building material of choice here early on, although considering that we have a large steel vein right inside of our temporary shelter, I think that will play a role too. 
And so, as our colonists have worked tirelessly through the night and the first morning arrives, Squeaks puts up a steel butcher table, and unsurprisingly, a short while later, Master Chef Took starts chopping. A small temporary campfire then not only serves as a meeting spot, but also as a place to cook meals, although I think we will shortly have the resources to build something a bit less primitive. And so, over the next few hours, our small mountainside refuge is slowly taking shape. Around midday, we are informed of yet another hunting worksite, this one protected by only three people, but also slightly further away, and once again offering pemmican and some animal skin. And once again, let me know if you would like us to pay them a visit, we definitely won't do that here today, as we have more important matters to take care of first. One such matter then, one of the main new features introduced in the Biotech DLC, yes, the game now officially features children. And obviously that includes various means of acquiring them. And thankfully we start things off here with an already established couple in Took and Squigs. They are not husband and wife just yet, but maybe that happens in the future. Either way, we can have them try for a baby, even though I somehow doubt that a sleeping spot inside of a cavern surrounded by bears is the right place to get cozy. Now, it was just a brief nap anyway, in the evening hours our colonists are once again busy roaming around. You can see it here, Squeaks has already closed off a small kitchen area. While we unfortunately also have our first colonist on the verge of a mental break, Wyatt's not too happy with his early accommodations. Not to mention that in the few hours we have been on this map, he has already been insulted three times. So, best to have him play some hoopstone for the rest of the day. And then, a few hours later, our colonists finally all get to rest. It is their first proper night of sleep in the rainforest, and already I would say they have everything they need to survive. On the next morning then, Squeaks puts up a stonecutter's table while Kevin has already reached 10% of the Major Architect Structure's research, which, as you can clearly see, also comes with another side effect that I have not yet mentioned. It causes all plant life in an area around it to slowly but steadily die off, and I think the beginning of that is already clearly visible here. That is also why we are now chopping down all the trees next to the architect structure while they still live. It won't take long and all the plant life here will vanish, so we better get everything we can out of it before that happens. However, as you can see, Light might not be the most suitable man for the task, because unfortunately the architect emanation mood debuff scales with psychic sensitivity, and that means for Light it is a lovely minus 31 mood penalty, so I have marked out a little safe zone here to ensure that he stays away. Inside of the cave, meanwhile, we are getting some bets going. Yes, we are all about charity and giving up our own comfort for the sake of helping others, but I don't think that that means that our colonists have to sleep on the cave floor. After all, it is much easier to be charitable after a good night's sleep. And so, as another night sets across the rainforest, our colonists get some rest in their very own beds. Unlike in the previous series, pawns now also take off their headgear when they sleep. This was added in the 1.4 patch that came out with Biotech, I believe, and it definitely helps to remind us who's behind those helmets. So hiding their faces, for the believers of Boyo, that is no longer as important as it was in the Cult of Jinx. On the next morning then, just as Took and Squeaks get their romance on, we have our first bit of trouble arrive. It is only a mad chinchilla, but it is very close to architect researcher Kevin, who is then also unfortunately not quick enough to outrun it before backup arrives. Just as a reminder, Kevin himself is incapable of violence, so Took and Squeaks have to step in here. And just as they do, we get the good news that that bit of romance was apparently enough. As it happens, Squeaks is already pregnant, so we will be able to celebrate the birth of our first baby shortly. Kevin, meanwhile, only suffered a few bruises, and thanks to the medical ineptitude of the rest of the colonists, self-tending is still the best option here. And with the rainforest harboring a plethora of dangerous illnesses, we are not wasting any precious medicine on this. A short moment later then, we are presented with our first quest opportunity. This one actually a charity quest, so perhaps a good way to start us off on our charitable ways. A group of children are asking us for help, and that help has to come in the form of 700 silver, a good chunk of our starting funds, but giving it away would be the way of Boyo. One of the children here, you can see it, the aptly named Sao, is actually a pigskin. As most of you probably already know, the Biotech DLC also introduced different races. The regular humans, including all of our colonists, are called baseliners. Other races, like the pigskins for example, have a noticeably different gene pool. This gives them a number of specific advantages and disadvantages. I think we'll get into that at a later point down the line. 
For now, we await the arrival of the children as Squeak starts walling off some rooms. Unfortunately, though, I did not pay quite as much attention as I should have to the path the kids actually need to take to get to us. As you can see, it leads them straight past a nest of mega spiders. And they are children, so this goes about as well as one would have expected. So, our charitable ways definitely not off to a great start. The quest has failed, but at least two of the children escaped the map unharmed. Still, the pigskin child is dead, and this definitely could have been avoided. The least we can do then is to avenge the children and to make sure that this does not happen again. The mega spiders are quickly cleared out and we can loot some insect jelly as a reward, while Light is hauling the dead child back to the base. And back inside that small cave, Squix is constructing a small wooden sarcophagus, and in the evening, illuminated by a few dark torches, our colonists assemble for the burial. This sarcophagus now a grim reminder that walking the path of Boyo is not an easy task, and that in the future our small colony will have to do better. The sarcophagus itself then engraved with a portrayal of an angry abstract shape. The work is shaded in hues of black and blue, and the lower part of the image is dominated by hundreds of blacksmiths. Interesting imagery all of that, and despite this quest going horribly wrong, there is an upside to all of this, as with a dead person inside, the sarcophagus now gives a meditation sci-focus bonus of 20% per day. Should we acquire a few more dead bodies, this can be increased up to 28%, and coincidentally, that is the bonus that the anima tree gives. So at the moment, the anima tree is still the more powerful meditation focus for our psycasters, and except for light, it is also the only one they can use with the natural meditation focus type. However, due to being a psychopath, light can actually also engage in morbid meditation, and that is exactly what the sarcophagus here offers. So he might not gain psi focus as quickly as he would from the anima tree, but the sarcophagus is closer and safer, and it shouldn't be too difficult to bump the percentages up a few points. The next morning then arrives with a rather interesting turn of events. After making her pregnant, Took now proposes to Squeaks, but surprisingly she rejects the offer, and with that their relationship is now over. So, looks like we've got Squeaks pregnant with Took's child, but no longer with him. Seems to me like drama is very much back on the menu. And with Light meditating at the poor pigskin sarcophagus, and with another bedroom being mined out for Squigs, it is no surprise that Took now goes on a food binge. Looks like he needs to drown out those sorrows, and thankfully we have plenty of meals in storage. Squigs' new single bedroom then is quickly mined out, also giving us a handy amount of steel, as we receive our first ancient ruin quest. As you can see though, pretty far away from our base, but potentially holding some interesting rewards for us. So once again, let me know if you would like us to go out and explore it. The evening then rolls around and eventually Took stops gulping down food. This time, however, Took and Squigs go to sleep in separate bedrooms. We'll have to see if this relationship can perhaps be mended or if it is indeed over for good. We are then informed of yet another work site, this one containing components, which could actually be interesting considering that we have just put down the blueprints for a research bench, but more on that later, for now we are interrupted by a combat supplier trade caravan. Our good friends from the colony of Anum are visiting, let's see what they have for sale. Before we can engage in friendly barter, however, a new grizzly bear sees the light of the world. Clay Brown has given birth, and so it is time to give out a name from the list of patron supporters in the naming rights tier and above, and this time the name Odarka was chosen. So congratulations on joining the flock, I actually do not have a precise idea yet on what to do with all of these bears. At least in these early stages, however, they are a solid defense force, so I think we'll keep them around. Just a few seconds later then, we have to give out yet another name, as it is time to name our settlement, and for this one, patron supporter Red Chapel was chosen. So the believers of Boyo now officially inhabiting the colony of Red Chapel, it remains to be seen what kind of colony it eventually turns out to be. The trade caravan then not really carrying too much interesting stuff. We are exchanging some silver and insect jelly for a fresh new marine helmet, a helmet that can then go on squigs, as her current one is not only tainted, but also slowly approaching tattered quality. Grizzly Bear Baby Odarka then also immediately demands our attention again. It looks like in his search for food he has picked a fight with a tortoise, and well, it looks like the tortoise did not go down easy. Luckily though, Kevin is quick on the scene to stop the bleeding, even without medicine. Very fittingly then, Kevin also receives a surgery inspiration, as we have just finished building a research bench, so let's briefly talk about research. Now, you may have noticed it already, but to avoid this series becoming an absolute slog, I have kept all already unlocked research projects active. That means that we will not have to research the basics like furniture and stone cutting again, which I just think makes sense and would otherwise stand in the way of making some actual progress. 
Still, just like in the first chapter with the Cult of Jinx, we are putting a limit on our research level, this time up to industrial, so we will not be allowed to research Space and Ultra Tech in this playthrough. This does also have some implications regarding the ways we will interact with some of the new biotech content, but we'll get to that in due time. For now, I think it would be a good idea to put down some heal root. As we have seen, life in the jungle can be dangerous, and I don't want to use our medicine reserves too early. By the way, while the caravan is still here, we are dumping more and more insect jelly on them. We do have plenty of other food sources and it makes us a pretty penny. In the evening hours then, we send out a small hunting party to hunt ourselves some rhinos. Not only will they provide us with plenty of meat for the next few days, but rhinoceros leather is actually among the most sturdy clothing materials in the game. And with Wyatt, we do have a somewhat skilled craftsman in our ranks. And so, with several dead rhinos and another dead alpaca being hauled back to the base, it is time for yet another grizzly bear birth. This one will be named Kate, or Keats, I'm not exactly sure, named after the patron supporter of the same name. And it definitely brings up the question again of what we want to do with all of those bears. As you know, I do like to switch things up from series to series. So if you have any creative ideas or suggestions for other animals that we could raise in this series, feel free to let me know. The caravan from our allies then eventually leaves and leaves behind a small gift of 9 gold. While we are putting the finishing touches on what will most likely be our base for the next few weeks, I think we should be able to squeeze one or two more colonists in here, but of course, again, eventually we'll look elsewhere for a more permanent solution. In the middle of the night then we can see Grizzly Bear Kate, also injured, looks like he picked the fight with a wild boar, but again nothing that Kevin can't patch up. And yes, for the moment it is very much intended to have our grizzly bears find food of their own. There are enough small critters out here in the jungle that they shouldn't have too much trouble with that. On the next morning then, another rhinoceros goes down to Took and Light, and we also have yet another caravan arrive. This one, however, just a group of tribes people, and so unfortunately they don't have anything too interesting to sell, which leaves us to just dump a few furs and leathers on them, so we're slowly making back the silver that we spent on the helmet earlier. Speaking of furs and leathers, Squix has now also constructed a tailoring bench, and we are immediately using that to turn all of that rhinoceros leather into something useful. We'll have Wyatt make pants and shirts from it. Yes, the time of Muffalo Bull Tribal Wear is slowly nearing its end. In the evening then, we finish things off with a wooden art bench, and with that we now have all of the early game production facilities up and running. This here now also provides a good place to work for Light, who is somewhat skilled in artwork, and will now start making a marble sculpture. And with that, I think we have achieved pretty much all I wanted to achieve in this first episode. We have food, we have shelter, and we can produce everything we need for the time being. Although we should probably start researching to unlock more stuff soon. And here the big question that I have to ask you would be what to research first. Obviously, the gatekeeping position of electricity here makes it seem like the most pressing option. However, keep in mind that we are playing in the jungle and want to protect ourselves from all of the deadly diseases that exist in here. So going down the drug production path to unlock panoxicillin might be interesting too. Now, that is of course only one choice to make. The other would be where we want to put up our permanent place of residence. The caves that we are currently occupying are definitely too small to house a fully-fledged base, so perhaps we want to move up a bit further to the north because that's where the anima tree is. Unfortunately, it would not make a lot of sense to build directly around the tree. As you know, that severely weakens its use as a meditation spot, but we do have plenty of mountain to the left of it that we could dig into. However, if we are already talking about a mountain base, then I don't think we get around talking about this spot right here, these two sides of the underground river. We already have a sizable cave network up to the north and then vast unexplored mountain to the south, and in combination with the river this could definitely make for a very defensible place. But once again, that is a decision that I would like to hear your thoughts on, so let me know where you would like us to settle down. Finally then, we have the big question of colony leadership. So far, I have not yet made this decision on purpose. In these first few days, nobody has really stood out to earn that title, but somebody will have to lead the believers of Boyo, and I would like to know who you think it should be. That's probably enough with the questions for now though. At this point I only have two more quick things to mention. First of all, we are of course continuing to play on Randy Random losing his fun difficulty, with the threat scale bumped up to 500% just like in the last series. Thanks to the vanilla expanded framework mod, I was also able to add the new factions introduced by Biotech, as well as to reactivate mechanoids, because I think it's time they start paying attention to us. 
And speaking of mods, the full mod list can be found at the end of the description by the way, apart from a handful of quality of life improvements and a few relics from the last series that I do not want to uninstall just yet for fear that they could break something, we are once again playing mostly vanilla RimWorld, so no fancy new mechanics, no crazy new gameplay features, for the most part this is the game we all know and love. And because your guys' love for the game and the videos I make on it can sometimes reach extraordinary levels, I am once again hoping that we will see plenty of fan art for the series, just like we did with The Cult of Jinx. So just as an FYI, the best way to send me your artwork is via email to pete at petecomplete.com, the email address this played on screen right now. Alternatively, if you are a Patreon supporter, you will also gain access to the Pete Complete Discord, where fan art is of course also very much appreciated. And I think that's it for today's first episode of RimWorld Biotech. We are off to a great start, I think, one failed act of charity and a breakup, and I'm very much looking forward to see what else Jungle Life has in store for us. So let's make the cut here for today. As always, I hope you enjoyed the video and are as excited for this series as I am. In any case, I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. And as always, if you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can of course subscribe to stay up to date and get notified when the next video goes up, grab some merch over on shop.peatcomplete.com or get your name into the series too by supporting me over on Patreon. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time. Cheers.